Hello there, I'm Celeste. Thanks for joining me today. Well, I just wanted to jump on for a few moments and share with you um, what I've been enjoying reading this week, and that is The Long Winter by Laura Ingalls Wilder. I have most of the Laura Ingalls Wilder Little House books and a few biographies as well. I treasure these hardcover editions that I've had since my childhood. In fact, the only one that I'm um, looking for uh, that's missing from my set is On the Banks of Plum Creek. And I have actually just located a copy of that today and I've ordered it. So then I'll have a complete set of the Little House books. And even though I would normally read them all in order, um, I've decided to dip into the long winter, seeing as it's been quite snowy and chilly this week, um, and it seemed like a good time to read it. The books can stand alone as well as being read in order. So um, if you're interested, grab a copy of this. You won't be sorry. The winter of 1880 to 1881 was one of the most severe on record in the Dakotas. And so that's what Laura describes in this book. And I'll just read you a little excerpt. Um, the blizzard started in October, so the chapter is called October Blizzard. Laura woke up suddenly and Pa had kindled the fire. He was trying to warm his hands. It was roaring in the stove, but the air was freezing cold. Ice crackled on the quilt where the leaking rain had fallen. Winds howled around the shanty, and from the roof and all of the walls came the sound of scouring. Carrie sleepily asked, what is it? It's a blizzard, Laura told her. You and Mary stay under the covers. Careful not to let the cold get under the quilts, she crawled out of the warm bed. Her teeth chattered while she pulled on her clothes. Ma was dressing too, beyond the curtain, but they were both too cold to say anything. They met at the stove where the fire was blazing furiously without warming the air at all. The window was a white blur of madly whirling snow. Snow had blown under the doors and across the floor and every nail in the walls was white with frost. Pa had gone to the stable. Laura was glad that they had so many haystacks in a row between the stable and the shanty. Going from haystack to haystack, Pa would not get lost. A b blizzard, Ma chattered, in October. I never heard a... She put more wood in the stove and broke the ice in the water pail to fill the tea kettle. The water pail was less than half full. They must be sparing of water, for nobody could get to the well in the storm. But the snow on the floor was clean. Laura scooped it into the wash basin and set it on the stove to melt for washing in. So this is a really great chronicle of that long winter. And um, I'm really having a good time remembering the first time I read this, which I believe was also in the winter time. And uh, so I've really been enjoying that this week. And reading that um, has led me to some other books that I'm super excited about as well that I'd like to share with you. And it, was, it had gotten me wondering about their livelihood and about the land and the food and animal rearing and um, the farming that they did there, the crops that they raised and how they observed the weather uh, on the plains and prairies in the 1800s. And that led me to this book, The World of Laura Ingalls Wilder by Marta McDowell, The Frontier Landscapes That Inspired the Little House Books. So that's this book here. You can see the covered wagon there. I'm just going to show you a few 
pictures from this. It starts with her time in the big woods and talks about all the flora and the fauna and um, the food they ate when they were there that they trapped and hunted for and caught the wildlife that they saw in the big woods, the crops that they were able to grow in their little garden, and um, there's some little horticultural drawings there. It's just absolutely fantastic. And um, it does go on to talk about the long winter. And this shows a stereoscopic image of snow blockading a locomotive in southern Minnesota during the hard winter and explains why trains could not get through to Desmet. I think that's just phenomenal. And um, yeah, oh my gosh, what an exciting book. I'm going to go much more into depth with this book in a future video. So I guess this is kind of an announcement as well of a video that will be coming. Um, as soon as I started looking through this book, I knew that I wanted all of Marta McDowell's books. And so I've ordered all of them and I'm excited to announce that soon I'll be doing a video. It's sort of what I call pen and trowel and it's going to be a focus on the natural landscapes and gardens of best loved children's authors. And so um, I hope to do that late winter, early spring, and I'll have a whole slew, a big haul of books uh, to share with you at that time. Uh, but for now, I truly recommend this one if you want to know the seasons of the year and how they turned and what Laura observed, and also uh, interactions with the Dakota uh, Native Americans and the Osage tribes and how they survived the winters as well. So, um, fantastic book. And the other night, I was able to locate a really good documentary about the life of Laura Ingalls Wilder that you can find um, on a streaming service. And I found it on PBS, Public Television, and it is called Laura Ingalls Wilder, Prairie to Page. It was really fascinating and really well done. And it goes through her entire life and all of her books and her daughter, Rose Wilder Lane. Uh, it goes through her relationship with Almanzo, what's factual in her books, what's not so factual, um, teaching and appreciating the Laura Ingalls Wilder books in the context of um, and Native American issues and how the books have aged and how one can still appreciate them as long as you have that context. So I really recommend that documentary as well. And also um, this book, which is called Prairie Fires, the American Dreams of Laura Ingalls Wilder by Carolyn Frazier. Now this book does tend to be quite academic and um, it's a little heavier read, but if you're a Laura Ingalls Wilder fan, um, I definitely recommend getting this one as well. I've kind of been pairing it, um, so I'm reading a couple chapters of this one and then sort of chronologically going along with this book, The Children's Blizzard by David Laskin. And this is a really great book. Um, it's about the 1888 blizzard. So I was not aware that there were actually several blizzards. There was the long winter that Laura Ingalls Wilder writes about. Um, that one is actually called the snow winter of 1880 to 1881. And I'll just read you what David Laskin says about that on page 59 of this book. Laura Ingalls Wilder made the snow winter the subject of her novel, The Long Winter. Every detail in the book matches up exactly with the memories of pioneers, the grinding of wheat and coffee mills, the endless hours of twisting prairie hay for fuel, the eerie gray twilight of the snowed in houses, the agony of waiting and hoping that the trains would get through the steady creep of starvation when they failed to yet again. 
By midwinter, Laura and her sisters had learned to scan the northwest horizon for the cloud, the single sooty cloud that presaged another storm. Even the rare sunny days only heightened their anxiety. No one knew how soon the blizzard would come again, wrote Wilder. At any moment, the cloud might rise and come faster than any horses could run. So that was the snow winter, but there was also the children's blizzard, which took place in 1888. And that's what Laskin focuses on in his book here. The story becomes so gripping that you just don't want to put the book down. I'll give you some of the descriptions as the storm was starting. Lilia, a teacher, ventured a few yards out the front door at its beginning and was near not getting back. The wind struck her with such violence as to bring her head down to her knees and take away her breath. She said she was near falling on her face, and she knew that if she fell, she would not get up. Many said that the onset of the storm was preceded by a loud roar like an approaching train. It was a roar they not only heard, but felt vibrating in their gut. So this is just a really uh, gripping and compelling read. It's um, very sadly called the children's blizzard because so many children were lost in that storm trying to get home from their schoolhouses. When the storm began, the, a lot of the teachers, instead of keeping the children in the school, thought they better get the kids home. And so they dismissed them for the day. And the children who normally could very easily go over the fields and go back home the mile or even a quarter of a mile um, were lost. Um, it's also just a, a fascinating read and really gives me an appreciation um, and respect, first of all, for weather and also for um, the ingenuity that people used to try to get people safe and get them back home. And the, some of the family members who went out, for example, there was a little boy who went out and was searching for his brother. And uh, he realized that there was more visibility if he got down on his hands and knees on the ground. And he found his brother that way by luck and um, dragged him home. Uh, so, yeah, it breaks my heart to hear stories like that, but it's a really important part of our American history, I think. And so I highly recommend um, David Laskin's book, The Children's Blizzard, and again, um, The World of Laura Ingalls Wilder, and of course, The Long Winter. And I think I'm going to make myself a cup of hot chocolate now and curl up with this one and keep reading. That's all I have for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, let me know what you're reading right now, and I'll see you again real soon. Bye-bye.